Welcome to a video on the Honda S2000. Now this is really an extension of a review that I did on this very exact car. And there's so much detail in there that you should just watch that first. It's probably gonna help you in a lot of ways. If you've already watched that or you're on the fence about buying an S2000 or you've decided to, consider this a buyer's guide for the exterior, interior, and more of the mechanical aspects of pretty much every generation S2000. So get ready. Now when you have a vehicle like the S2000, it's been out for about 20 years, there's gonna be a ton of information and misinformation about it. And because this car was released around the era of when internet forums were in their heyday, like S2KI, most of the knowledge base is there. And it was a mess trying to find out what you wanted then, and it's a mess trying to find out what you want now. So what I'm trying to do is consolidate some of that, what I've learned through all the years from people who've made a ton of mistakes, who've run through the gamut of owning these cars, and trying to make this pretty cohesive. Now pretty much like every other vehicle, you're going to inspect the exterior. Now the S2000 is not some exotic or esoteric platform. It's like every other 90s Honda you've seen. So the only thing that's different really here is you have an aluminum hood and you can check that simply by sticking a magnet to it. If it's had some knockoff steel hood put on, well, your magnet's gonna stick to it, but every other panel is steel. You can tell by sticking a magnet to all of it, the doors, the fenders, the rear quarter, the rear trunk, but the bumpers are plastic. So it's easy to tell if somebody's replaced the fenders with fiberglass because your magnet will not stick to it. The other thing, like many Hondas, every single panel has a VIN number to it that should be tied to obviously a title or the engine code. So the hood has a VIN sticker, the front two fenders, the front bumper, the doors, the trunk, and the rear bumper all have that. And that makes it extremely easy for you to know if a, if a bumper or a panel has been replaced. Now, I'm just gonna say this. These are older cars. And the way that the S2000 is designed, the front bumpers are absolutely chip and rock magnets. Same thing with the front windshield. You might not see a Honda name on the front glass because it's been replaced. They're extremely easy to chip and crack. The bumpers take a lot of abuse if they, if they weren't wrapped. And let's be honest, back in the day, there was 3M clear bra, but a lot of people didn't use that. So it's possible that the front bumper has been re repainted completely or replaced. Windshields could be replaced. Rear bumpers could have been repainted. This is not the end of the world unless you're looking for some collectible, you know, if you're gonna stick it in a garage and store it forever. You know, these are very common, you know, replacement items or repaint items. Now, sometimes you're not gonna find a VIN sticker on the inner part of the door here. And if you don't, if it was a factory Honda replacement door, you'll see a sticker that says DOT, usually with a Honda badge. That means the entire door frame has been replaced. And the problem with these doors is if the skin or the outer shell gets damaged, sometimes body shops will just replace the entire door because in, in all fairness, it's a lot easier to do that sometimes than trying to reskin the door. So even a door replacement isn't that big of a deal as long as you see the VIN on this inner in this inner sill here, which is kind of right by the door latch. If you don't see a VIN there, then chances are this thing was in a pretty hefty accident or side swiped. Now the next thing is some common sense. People get off the deep end when they're looking for a perfect car or something and they just get really worried. You pop the trunk of the hood and like I said, there's a VIN number on all the panels. Let's say you're missing a VIN on the bumpers and you're just freaked out what happened. Well, it's possible the VIN got rubbed off during a detail or whatever. If you have a VIN number still on the, the trunk lid or on the hood, chances are you're fine because this car's so low that if you really got an impact, any hit in the back would damage the, the trunk lid or the hood and it would have to be replaced and you wouldn't have your VIN on there. So again, you just have to use a little bit of common sense. Now the next thing seems real obvious. When you get in the trunk, look at the condition. If you go in the bottom and you see that it's missing the jack and the tools, the tow hook, or they're severely damaged, that means that somebody went through some type of ordeal with this. If they're missing completely, well, you wanna know why. Or better yet, the whole trunk is lined with this kind of felt material. And if this is damaged, missing, partly removed, there's a ton of clips out, the spare tire is all mangled, uh, chances are this was modified. Um, you know, I've had to remove part of mine to remove the spare tire so I can get to the shock towers to adjust my dampers. And that's really common on these cars. If you see a perfect trunk lining with all the clips, 
everything looks pristine, it's a good chance this car has never been screwed with. Now the next thing to look at are the headlights and taillights. If somebody says, well, I'm a single owner and uh, I've always garaged my car and the headlights are UV damaged with some haze over them or the taillights, you know that there's something suspect there. And you know, you have to decide whether that's a big deal or not. The next thing is kind of more important and that is the wheels. If you're getting a stock car from 2000 to 2001, they had this silver cast or silver paint to them. In 2002 and three, it was the same identical wheel, but they added a bit of gold metallic fleck in the paint color. So the wheel was just slightly different colored. So you can tell easily if somebody had a wheel replaced because the biggest thing was, is if you had an 02 or an 03 uh, and you had it refinished or replaced, oftentimes they'd put the, the older wheel with the silver on there and you can tell in the paint color. From 2005 and 2006, I'm sorry, 2004 to 2005, you would get the AP2 wheels and they were identical between both years. And then they changed them again. But definitely look at the wheel condition if it's a stock wheel. And look for differences between one or the other. If one is in immaculate condition and the paint color seems just like slightly off, you know that that wheel's probably been refinished and you wanna look very closely at that side to see if there's any damage around there. Now the next thing you want to look at is the fender liners, front and rear. Now if somebody has run wider wheels and tires almost always on these cars, you're going to see fender liner damage, this plastic here. If somebody has rolled the fenders to accommodate them, you will see this lip folded in and the plastic liner will not be attached via a plastic clip very easily. You might even see a zip tie here, but one of the easiest ways to tell is fender liner damage or rub through. That way you know somebody has made some changes here if you're on stock wheels and tires and you still see that. Now if you're on a wider wheel and tire and you're okay with that, you're just gonna have to look for signs of damage from that wheel. Uh, you're gonna wanna look at the wheel condition obviously and then all the associated panels around here, the front bumper, the fender area, the rear fender area to make sure there's no severe damage to the paint from somebody running insanely sticky tires, which again is a super common thing on here. Now in the back, it's much of the same story. If somebody has run wider wheels and tires, a lot of times, namely if they've tracked it and they've lowered it a lot, this bumper tab here, which is a screw that holds the bumper to the fender may have been damaged or relocated farther down to, to fit that different wheel tire combination. So if you see a stock wheel, you still want to check to see if that's been altered at all. The second thing is rear quarter damage or rear end damage is extremely common on these cars from people sliding them out, curbing them, you know, sideways action into a fixed object. This panel gets a lot of replacement. Now that doesn't mean there's severe body work, but it's possible that this panel has been repainted and you won't, it won't affect the VIN numbers. So you wanna check the paint color on here and on the bumper to see if it matches. The second thing is this entire wheel arch has a rubber, uh, a, you know, a rubber seal or just weather stripping that runs all along this part. If the paint or the panel has been retouched, a lot of times this stripping will be gone or somebody will have, might not have replaced it. It's an easy way to tell. Also check the fender well for paint or undercoating that's not there. If there's been a lot, of a lot of paint work done, sometimes they won't repaint the undercoating and it should be solid black. There's splotches everywhere, either the tires or rocks have chipped it off or you know somebody did a, a bad job with the repaint. But again, all the combinations of these things should help you identify if there's something really suspect here. One of the last things to look at with the exterior is the windshield and I talked about that earlier. It's really common to have these replaced. And the bottom left, you can see, if it doesn't say Honda, it might say PPG, it might say some other brand like I have. Take a look at the uh, stripping, the weather stripping or the rubber seal that goes along the windshield. Is it bubbling up? Are there any defects in the way that it was done? Is it coming off? It might be something you have to deal with. The second thing you wanna look at is, are there any adhesive marks or stickers that were left behind near the passenger side or driver side on the top? A lot of times if somebody's done a track day or autocross, they'll put stickers on your windshield or decals to give you a number or how many runs you've had. And if there's adhesive all over, you know that's probably the case. The second thing is you wanna look for suction cup residue on the inside part of the glass. If there's a ton of them, well, you probably know it was a camera mounted, a GPS module for track time. And the whole point of this is to understand, to ask the seller. 
If they're not going to disclose this stuff to you, it's a pretty big red flag. You know, tracking these cars, autocrossing them, that's what they're for. But if an owner's not going to tell you what they did and how they kept up with the car, uh, it's, it's just not a good thing. Now, before I move on to the mechanical aspect of the S2000, which is one of the most important things, in terms of the exterior, a visual inspection is going to be your best bet. Do not go by Carfax. Do not go by AutoCheck because a lot of the incidents with these cars may have happened before any of that was recorded. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, even on cars as new as 2016, there might be an incident or accident reported on a Carfax, not on an AutoCheck and vice versa. So just know that you're gonna wanna visually inspect this or get a ton of pictures before you sign on the dotted line. All right, one of the last big things is the top. You get in here, you want to check the latches first thing is you want to check the latches do they hold in place if you push if you if you can pull them down without pushing the buttons in on the side well then you know the latches are damaged how do they release how do they latch is the top bent check out the operation put the top down and a good test to see if the battery is really bad put the top down without starting the car because if it's really straining to go down Chances are you have a bad battery or there's a problem with the motor or the top is bent. If it goes down cleanly, uh, that's a pretty positive sign. Now the soft top condition is a big deal. It's expensive to replace and there's a ton of labor that goes into doing it. So unless you're just going to stick a hard top on here and never use the, the retractable roof, you're going to want to look at this. The first thing to know is in 2000 and 2001, it had a plastic rear window and it was just a sh such a shitty design. I mean, that window would fade, crack. So pretty much all of those have been replaced if they have a ton of mileage on them. So if you see an 01 or a 2000 with a glass rear window, you know it's been done. Now, if you have a 2002 to 2009, you're gonna wanna look at the condition. And the first suspect thing to look for when you put down this roof is when you put the top down, it might not go down all the way and is kind of on this upward position. If you see it not go down all the way, 10 to one, the fabric straps that, the fabric elastic straps that help pull it down all the way are completely worn out. It should go down pretty much flat, like that. Now there's a really easy fix to this and you're gonna wanna check the strap condition. All right, checking the straps. You put the top up pretty much right about here. And right about in this area, you can see a fabric strap. If it's really flimsy, and floppy, and no tension on it, well, you know you need to replace them. There is an aftermarket kit to do it. It's, you know, it takes you probably about 20 minutes to do. There's no drilling, there's no riveting. You just cut the old straps out, put these in, and it will bring it back to normal operating condition. If you leave it floppy and it's not going down all the way, it's gonna put a hole in the top eventually. The second thing to look forward is, uh, some of these bars in here, the support bars, have burrs from the factory and it will rub itself a hole into the top. And again, this is one of the most important things to inspect. If there's holes in this, it's gonna be a pain in the ass to replace and you might wanna negotiate the price down if they're even willing to do that. Now, when you get on the interior of an S2000, there's a lot of obvious things to look for, much like any car. You wanna look at carpet condition, floor mat condition, door panels, seats. Uh, the 2000 and 2001 had carpeted, uh, carpeted center tunnel here. It did not have a vinyl coating, so you want to look at the carpeting condition there. But one of the biggest things you can tell how an owner has kept it up by looking at little things like the seals, the door seals, the weather stripping, the plastics. Have they been taken care of? And since there's so much weather stripping on here and seals, um, if they dry out, you're going to have a lot of wind noise, a lot of just annoyances with squeaks and rattles. Now, I've always used 303 on my top. It's just old school. It's always worked. I've never had a problem with my top. And I always use the tried and true Shinitsu silicone grease. Uh, and you can use whatever you want. But as long as you use that, you can tell if an owner's used it because these seals will look brand new. If somebody's never touched them, it's going to look like dried out, discolored, really nasty. Same with the dashboard. Um, again, it's about maintenance and care. How does it look? Does it look maintained? Are there a ton of scratches on everything? Is the cluster scratched? Are there scratches all over the knobs and buttons and switches? How does the shift knob look? Is there scratches and gouges all over it? You know, obviously if somebody's wearing a ring, they're gonna tear up the stock knob. It's really soft. 
But you know, it's the attention to detail. If somebody's cared for this, you won't find a lot of wear and tear in here. Now, in terms of the seats, this is one of my big complaints about the S2000. I really dislike these seats. They're super narrow. So if you're not a skinny mini, I mean, I'm talking like under 180, you're gonna just wear out the bolsters on these seats. And it's really, really hard to find an S2000 with perfect seats. Even mine, uh, I'm a, I don't know, second or third owner of this car. The driver's seat is totally destroyed. The left bolster is totally worn out. The right side is in similar condition and there's just not a lot you can do about it. So if you're gonna get super anal about it, if you can find a perfect seat, you're gonna be lucky. Now the other things to check is, has this interior been modified at all? Namely the seats. How are the seat rails? Can you easily adjust it? Was there a camera mount put here? You know, that's another thing. Why would somebody put a camera mount there unless they're probably tracking or autocrossing the car? Uh, look at the steering wheel. Has it been modified, changed? If it's been modified at all, make sure everything is tight. If the head unit's been changed because the CD player in here sucks, the audio system really does, and most people are gonna swap it out. How is the wiring done? You know, if they're using a stock head unit or something similar, have they put a USB dongle? And I found a couple S2000s where it would leach power when the car was off and you'd have a flat battery in a week. It's little things like this that you want to check if it's been modified. You know, how was the work done? Did the owner have receipts for it? And, and just make sure that it's not a half-ass job is my point. The last thing that you're going to want to kind of realize when you're driving this is take a listen to, to driving it with the top latched. You know, you're going to notice some creaking and rattling here. You're going to hear little plastic, you know, creaks and rattles from the, the visors, from the top, maybe not being perfectly latched. If the seals haven't been lubricated properly, you're going to hear more wind noise. Uh, these seats make a ton of noise. The leather is like, oh, it's so annoying. And if you have your seatbelt on, it will rub on here and you're going to hear squeaks from the seatbelts all the time. It's another reason I hate these seats and the material. Um, it's not a quiet interior, but if you're hearing like really bad top rattle, like knocking sounds, stuff like that, you probably have bad latches. You're going to want to take a look at that. You might have a bent top. Um, if you're hearing excessive wind noise, like, like a hole through the top, uh, you know, you want to look at that. I mean, you're good. It's going to be a noisy cabin. That, that's just the bottom line, but you're going to want to look for things that are like super obvious that are just not right. Under the hood of the S2000, one of the most important places. When I've shopped for these cars, I would say 99% of the time, I'm choosing one with a completely stock engine bay. No aftermarket stuff. And if you find a car at a dealership that is fully loaded with an intake, a radiator, a catch can, a master cylinder brace, a strut bar, silicone hoses, all that crap, just, you know, if you're desperate, just make sure it's all installed properly. But I will tell you one thing, if you're just running a stock S2000 engine, no, you know, no power adders, there's really not a lot of need to change any of this. It is that good and I'm not kidding you. So if an owner, you're going to a private party and they have a bunch of modifications, ask why they did it, you know, who installed it, do they have the original factory parts to return it back to stock and it's probably gonna make you feel a lot better. Now with the AP2 or AP1, the major difference you're gonna tell under the hood is the AP1 had a silver coil cover. In AP2 in 2004, it went to gold and the rest of the time. In 2006, they went to drive by wire. So you don't see the throttle cables to the throttle body. You don't see the cruise control module and a little bit of changes there. But for the most part, it's all gonna look very similar throughout its nine years of production. Now one of the major things you wanna look for with an AP1 is you want to ask the owner if they had the valve retainers replaced because it's a real common failure point. Uh, they updated the valve retainers in 2004 because in the AP1 generation they cracked and a lot of times they crack from being over revved. Now that's not something you're going to be able to tell. If the owner doesn't know it's one of the first things you want to do is get that valve cover off, inspect the valve retainers on the intake side and you're going to, if, if you can't verify it's been replaced, just replace the retainers and the keepers. While you're in there do a valve adjustment. Valve adjustment, valve adjustment. It's one of the most important things on the S2000 motor to make sure it's in spec and you don't want it too tight and you don't want it too loose. It's something, there's an art to it. If you do that, this engine will run for a long time really well. The next thing you wanna make sure is you wanna replace the spark plugs if it hasn't been done with not aftermarket ones, Honda ones, and you wanna make sure the torque on the spark plugs is exact. Uh, you do not want these spark plugs loose. 
Uh, you want them a little bit over factory spec. Uh, the next thing you're going to want to look listen for is the timing chain rattling. And you're gonna, this is a really common problem as these cars age, doesn't matter, AP1, AP2, there's a problem with the design of the timing chain tensioner. And Billman has found this, he was one of the first to come up with the timing chain tensioner replacement. He's designed it, uh, redesigned the factory one. I've used them in two different cars, have had zero issues with it. It's one of the first things I do on every car, I just proactively replace it unless it's already in there. Pretty much everything else, you want to make sure that your coolant system is bled properly, that you have extreme hot heat coming out of the heater in the car, otherwise it might have some air in it. So that's another thing you want to check. Make sure all the fluids are right. Uh, namely, your brake fluid, your clutch fluid, uh, the engine oil should be clean when you check it. If it's low when you're shopping, if it's low and it's really dark, huge red flag. The last few things to talk about in terms of maintenance Early on, these motors had a problem with their map sensor, and people didn't really understand why, if it was getting fouled or loose. So Honda released an updated SKU for the map sensor, which is just a glorified plastic harness with a zip tie to keep it in there securely, and it's eliminated all the issues with that. So if you don't have that zip tie on that map sensor, order it from Honda. The next thing you're going to want to do is make sure that the throttle bodies are cleaned on this car. It doesn't matter if it's drive-by-wire or the old school with the throttle cable. Keep that clean, otherwise you might have some weird performance or idle issues. Last thing, from 2000 to 2005, it had an idle air control valve. And you gotta keep that sucker clean or it'll, you know, your idle will start to get really weird, it'll rev higher, it'll just kind of feel kind of shaky. So that's another, those are kind of just two maintenance items that you're gonna wanna look at on these cars. After 2006, they got rid of that and the air pump so you don't have to worry about it. Now on to the mechanical aspects of the S2000. And this underbody section is one of the most important parts of this car. So many people get hung up on paint color, swirl marks, is there scratches on the bumpers? All of that is aesthetics. If this underneath is junk, well, you can walk away. And the first thing I'm gonna tell you is if you're looking, at a, if you're looking for a used S2000 at a dealership and you're out of state, which is gonna happen so often, Talk to the salesperson, let them know you want to talk to the service manager. Have them put it on a lift and have him send you pictures from his cell phone or whatever and email it to you. I've done this on every single car I've bought out of state and it's almost been a non-issue every single time. And there's some things that you're going to look for right away. So let's take a look. Now we're going to start at the front part of the car. Now if you're buying it from a private party or a dealership and they're telling you garage kept, uh, never driven in winter. It's super easy to tell on a Honda like this. Like I said at the start, it's a 90s Honda. If it's touched snow and salt for even a year or two or been owned on a coast with the ocean breeze, you're going to see surface rust all over everything on here. Your control arms are all cast steel. So they're going to be just covered in this lovely rustic look, which this car doesn't have. Your control brace or your braces for the subframe, the coating will be all stripped off and there will be rust all over all of this including the subframe. The subframe is one of the easiest things that will rot immediately. If you see rust all over this you know it was driven in winter or is it, it was exposed to a lot of salt. The subframes rot out that's one of the first things that rot out and the second thing you're gonna see which is really common with older Hondas is you want to inspect the brake lines, the hard lines which is right here it's wide open you really don't even need to get the car in the air you just stick your head if you see these lines, any rust uh, anywhere on them, you know that it was exposed to salt. Same thing with the, the plastic carrier that takes the brake lines. All you have to do is look through here. If you see rust on these lines, it's going to be a pain in the ass to replace. Brake lines are a pain. Same thing with fuel lines. So if you don't see any rust on here anywhere on pretty much surface rust or anything, you're golden. And despite you can see the front lip of this bumper being all damaged on the car I chose, I was okay with that because the underbody I knew was never driven in winter. Now the next thing you want to look at is suspension components. And one of the most obvious things where you can pick up on damage right away is if the car's older, you have a upper control arm that has got surface rust on it and it looks like, you know, old. And then you have a shiny, bright, lower control arm and everything else is rusted around it, you know that one of those suspension components were replaced easily. Look at the nuts and the bolts. Are a couple of them shiny and the other of them all corroded or just rusty looking? It's an easy way to pick up on things. 
The next thing you're going to want to look at is the brake system. Have the brakes been modified? Does it still have the factory dust shield around the brake rotor? A lot of times with aftermarket kits, you have to cut the dust shield off. If the dust shield's missing, you know that the brakes were likely modified. Are there holes in the fender lining up front where somebody ran brake ducts? And again, this is up to you what's important, what's not, but it's things to look at. Now, once you get towards the middle part of the car, you want to look at the engine oil pan and the transmission case. Is there any scraping? Is there any noticeable damage to the cooling fins? Do the drain plugs and the fill plugs have washers or crush washers? Uh, is there any le leaks from the clutch slave cylinder and this line from the bleeder, any of that? Make sure all the uh, brake lines look like they're in good condition, no bends, no brakes. Make sure all that looks clean. One of the most obvious things to check, and I talked about this earlier, is oil filters. Take a look at it. You should see a blue Filtec S2000 oil filter, which looks like this, the PCX or the 15400. It's a specific filter for this car from Honda. It's a little bit bigger than the generic one that a lot of people switch to. If you see this big boy, you know somebody probably took more care of it. This is kind of the more generic Honda filter. If you see some shitty Walmart oil filter, it's again, you don't know what the maintenance was like on here. Now the next part to look at is kind of the underbody and the underbody coating. Is any of it chipped off? Is there just huge chunks taken out anywhere? That's a pretty big red flag that it's been off-road or been curbed. You know, do all the panels look straight? Does the coating look pretty even as much as it can be? Does the exhaust look like it's ready to rot off or fall off? You know, a little bit of surface rust on the flanges is good. Uh, if the hardware, the spring hardware connecting the cat to the header looks pretty good you know that you know this thing wasn't again in salt the back half of the s2000 now this is important much like the front you want to spend a lot of time looking at the suspension this entire setup is all cast steel the subframe is stamped steel and there is a subframe brace here that is also stamped steel now if somebody's asking top dollar for an s2000 it's pristine and you get under here this subframe is all rusty the Subframe bolts are rusted. This brace is rusted. The lower control arms look like disgraceful. That is not a top dollar car. It's been in a ton of salt and it's easy to tell right away. Now the other thing much like the front is the suspension. Since one of the most frequent accidents or damage to the S2000 is somebody spinning this out into a fixed object or a curb. Take a look at the wheels. Take a look at both sides. Do the control arms look newer on one side versus the other? If they look really shiny and new on one side, not on the other, it's a red flag. Keep your eyes towards the shiny side. Look for damage around the frame, the body, the subframe, all of that. Uh, you can tell pretty quickly. The half shafts are another thing that you can easily tell. If one half shaft has a ton of rust on the flange where it connects to the differential and the other doesn't, well, you know that one of the half shafts had been replaced. Now, this doesn't mean it's been in an accident. It might have been just worn out or, you know, but you have to use, your, do your due diligence here to do the inspection right. All right, last but not least under here, pretty common sense stuff. Check for leaks, check for leaks, check for leaks. Is the radiator leaking? Is there coolant? Is there oil dripping from the pan or the trans or the rear differential? You're gonna see this stuff. Look up by the oil filter sandwich plate. Is there oil residue there or higher up? You should be able to get up there with a flashlight. If you don't see anything, you're gonna be pretty safe. If you're choosing a car that's lower priced with a ton of rust, you're gonna wanna look at like bushings. You're gonna wanna look at the engine mounts. Do they look totally destroyed? Uh, you know, the other thing to note is since the alignment is all adjustable here, those bushings tend to get really rotted out, namely as soon as there's rust under here. So you're going to have to account, you know, account for replacing that, uh, either replacing the control arms or replacing the bushings. It's one of those things you're going to want to look at. And honestly, unless you're looking at a total bargain basement car, I would stay away with stay away from one of these that has any amount of rust on subframe or brake lines. I would just walk away from it personally. Now in the review video, I talked about a lot of the changes made between AP1 and AP2. A lot of the AP1 owners can modify that car with the AP2 parts, no issue. One of the main things that Honda changed in 2002 was they added new oil jet bolts to prevent oil starvation, which they were having an issue with on the early S2000s that were under high load. So if you have a car from 2000 to 2002, early 2002s, you're gonna wanna check to see if the oil jet bolts were replaced. They went from a two-hole design to a 
four hole design. And again, it's just worth pulling the oil pan to see if it was done if the person you're buying it from doesn't know. Now, before I close out this video, there's a few more things to talk about. Some of it has to do after you own the car. One of the last things to do to inspect this is to check for any play in the wheel bearings or the hubs. So you don't want to get this in the air. You want to push and pull and rotate and see if there's any just real bad sticking in the wheel when you turn it, namely in the back. You want to push and pull on that wheel. If there's a lot of play or clunking, obviously check to make sure that the wheel is tight uh, <laughs> first. If there's any play, you might have a bad wheel bearing and you will hear that during driving. Now the back rear wheel bearings are typically something that goes out pretty common and it's a pain in the ass to replace them. And it's definitely more of an issue on cars that are track driven. But Billman, who I talked about, who created, he's a mechanic who created a timing chain tensioner for this car. He recommends over torquing the rear axle nut. So that's something that you would want to do after you bought the car, just double check it. It's just an extra insurance policy to keep those bearings fresh and not you know burning up. Uh, the other thing you want to do, this car is super sensitive to fluids. And again, I, I don't really, I'm not a big proponent of telling you what fluids to use, but for engine oil, everybody's going to say have their own fluid. But just make sure it's changed, change it regularly. Uh, transmission, I always use the updated Honda transmission fluid, which was changed in I think like 2008. Uh, it's the green label manual transmission fluid. It works extremely well in this car, but it does not last a long time. If you have weird transmission issues on your test drive and you weren't sure when it was changed, that would be the first thing I would do is change the trans fluid. I got this car, it had zero trans issues. Put new Honda trans fluid in, perfect. Did four track days. I, it wouldn't go into gear sometimes. Sometimes it feels like it would want to pop out. Drain the trans fluid. It was perfectly clear. Drained it, put new trans fluid in, trans problems went away. Every gear was smooth again. So it's really sensitive to heat. It's really sensitive to fluid and it's something you're gonna to wanna to know about this. Gravity bleed the clutch. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to bleed the clutch, just gravity bleed it. I bleed my brakes once a year, but I use endless brake fluid, which really should last forever unless you're, you know, doing something stupid. Again, fluids, fluids, fluids. In the back, I use modal diff fluid, but again, just make sure you use the right spec for your driving conditions. All right, you're armed with as much information as I can provide you. Now it's time to take a test drive. The first thing, like every car, does it drive straight? Is the steering wheel turned? Does it pull when you're driving? Does it pull when you brake? You know, notice those things. This is one of Honda's first electronic power steering racks. There is no feel. It is very numb. That's normal. One of the biggest things about driving this car is the transmission. So let's cover that. Now, one of the most important things when you set off in an S2000 for the first time is to understand the way the manual transmission is. They designed this to give you direct mechanical feel to the transmission, which is extremely rare in modern cars. Most every single manual transmission assembly is now some type of cable operated shifter, which means there's a cable linkage to the gearbox, which is mostly to reduce vibration. You don't feel anything. You really don't feel the mechanics of the gearbox. Here you will. When you first start this car out, you want to drive it when the vehicle is room temperature or cold. You know, whatever cold is, you don't want it warmed up because you won't get a good sense of how the transmission is in terms of uh, wear and just if there's any issues. When you start out, you want to go extremely slow. And, and I'm going to tell you this, it doesn't matter what model year you have, these, this transmission operates best when there's a lot of heat in it. So when you go out and you go into first, second, you want to be very deliberate in your gears, not shifting hard. You want to shift at a low RPM. For those first 10 to 15 shifts, you kind of want to baby it because it's going to feel really notchy and it might even feel like it's grinding to you if you're not used to this. So it's a good habit to wait for the transmission to warm up before you start really forcing it. Uh, and it, if it feels notchy when it's cold for those 10, 15, you know, first 10 to 15 shifts, that is completely normal. What is not normal is for it to totally grind or not go into gear or fight you going into gear. If it's doing that when it's cold, it's a big red flag. Once this thing's warmed up, I'm talking like 15 minutes after like 50 shifts, you should not have any noticeable grinds or hesitation first through fourth at all. Even downshifting, you wanna check this. And 
the, the other big thing, unlike a lot of cars, is you do not want to skip shift this transmission. So if you're revving out third gear, like in a lot of cars, if you rev it out to 8,000 RPMs, and you're like, oh, you know what, I'm going to go in a sixth or fifth. It's really common for people to wear out the synchros in fifth and sixth gear on this car because they, they rev it out and they think they can shift into the higher, higher gears. You do not want to do that. If you rev out third, you want to go into fourth, fifth, sixth. With that said, that's why you also want to check out fifth and sixth gear on the highway. You want to make sure those upper gears are not grinding. If you have any grinds in those gears, uh, chances are you have worn synchros there. And again, this is a very finicky gearbox, and it's something you really want to pay attention to when you're driving. Once it's, it's got a lot of heat into it, it should be buttery smooth. If you have any gear rejections popping out of gear, uh, you all pretty much want to walk away because you're going to need a trans overhaul on this thing. Now you know more about the transmission. Let's cover the engine. When this starts cold, much like many Honda 4 poppers, there's a little bit of valve chatter. That's pretty normal for this car. Now once it warms up, you shouldn't hear any valve chatter. If you rev it, you shouldn't hear any chatter at all. And if you do, uh, either it needs a really good valve adjustment or there's something wrong. Be very alert of that. Timing chain tensioner. If, you, if the car is heated up or cold and you blip the throttle at a low RPM in neutral and you hear a rattle coming from the front right side of this car, could be the timing chain tensioner is going bad. You shouldn't hear a rattle. Now once the vehicle is warmed up, I'm going to say this. If you're coming from another car that has higher horsepower, that has torque, or has a turbo or forced induction, you're gonna wind this thing out from about zero or you know a thousand RPMs to six thousand RPMs, and you're gonna seriously think that something's broken. And I'm not kidding you. I even get back into this car after driving some press cars with real power, and I think there's something wrong with it. That's how little power it makes and no torque. That is normal for this car, and I'm telling you. After you get over 6,000 RPMs or the VTEC range for AP1 or AP2, you should hear a distinct switch over and all that power starts to build in that 3,000 RPMs. If you can't deal with that and you can't deal with keeping the RPMs in that range, this is not the car for you. But once it's there, it should be smooth, it should feel powerful, it should feel quick, and you'll have a lot of fun rowing through the gears. If there's hesitation at the high end or there's bucking or surging, there's something wrong. You should not have a weird or lopey idle. This does have a rougher idle, but it shouldn't be surging between like 8,000 or 800 RPMs to 1,500 RPMs or back down. It shouldn't be hanging at 1,300 RPMs or that either. Uh, it could be you know, throttle bodies dirty. It could be the idle air control valves dirty, uh, PCV, numerous things like that. But it should have a consistent idle, uh, even though it might just feel a little rough. Last thing to note is you shouldn't hear any noises from the rear end. You shouldn't hear any knocking or any knocking from the suspension. You shouldn't hear any grinding or weirdness from the differential in the rear end on a stock ride height. Um, if you hear any growling really bad in the rear, could have a problem with the diff. But for the most part, the only noises that should be weird is just the shit box interior rattling, the plastics, the top, the hinges, uh, you know, the visors, that stuff will creak but mechanically, this car should feel pretty solid. That's it for this video. Part three will cover modifications and what to look for and what to do and what not to do. I really hope this helps. This is educationally mostly. It's not for entertainment. Take care.